Hi guys, welcome to Mature Chemistry. So in today's video, I am going to try transforming some lemons into acetone and chloroform using some chemistry magic because as the old saying goes, when life gives you lemons, make acetone. But before I start doing anything, I need to inform you that a great part of the procedure for this video was borrowed from a fellow chemist youtuber, Experimental Chemistry. It is thanks to his video that I decided to make this one, so if you enjoy some good chemistry content, I recommend you to check him out. With that out of the way, I now need to assemble the plan. The first thing that I will do is extract some citric acid from lemons. This isn't actually that hard, but of course, me being me, I had to complicate things for myself. The second step will be converting the citric acid to acetone using some chemistry magic. This is the hard part, which I am still unsure how to do, but I will have to figure something out. The last step is going to be making my good old friend chloroform from the lemon acetone, and that actually will be pretty straightforward. In conclusion, this is going to be the hardest project I've ever attempted so far, and it all might just as well fail, but doing something new is always very exciting, so let's start. To start extracting the citric acid from lemons, I just need some, well, lemons, and I just happen to have some in my garden. I got about 10 medium sized lemons for the extraction, and after washing and cutting them in half, it was time to juice them. For that, I can of course just use a regular hand juicer, but why go so small when I have an automated juicing machine that has been collecting dust in a drawer for 2 years. After getting it out and washing it, I plugged it in, put a beaker under it to collect the juice, and started the juicing. When I am juicing lemons in this machine, I feel the impression of infinite power, and because of that, I decided to give it a name. From now on, I will call it the Juicer 5000. It has a really nice and satisfying system of draining the juice that is just mesmerizing. After all of the lemons were juiced, I had a nicely filled beaker of fresh lemon juice. By nicely filled, I mean that it is the biggest beaker that I got, and I really don't want to do chemistry in jars again, so I need to thank the lemon god for giving me the exact amount of juice I needed. The first reaction involved in the extraction of citric acid is converting the citric acid present in lemon juice to something called trisodium citrate, by neutralizing it with a sodium hydroxide solution. To do this step, I firstly needed to prepare a 20% sodium hydroxide solution. This involves just dissolving 20 grams of sodium hydroxide in 100 ml of cold water. Also, this has to be done under strong stirring, because otherwise the sodium hydroxide will melt into a solid layer on the bottom of the beaker, which is very hard to remove. After the sodium hydroxide solution was ready, I took it off the stirring and placed the lemon juice on a hot plate. It also has to be stirred, but my small stirring bar barely does anything to it. For the neutralization reaction, I had to slowly add the sodium hydroxide solution to the lemon juice until it reaches a pH of about 9. Before the addition, the pH is about 4 due to all of the citric acid present. Adding the sodium hydroxide slowly changes the juice color from yellow to orange, and also for some reason, it makes it smell like a swimming pool. After adding all of the sodium hydroxide solution, the pH was still too low, and the beaker was almost overflowing, so I had no other choice but to use a jar. I really wanted to avoid that, because jars are generally not great for doing chemistry in them, but oh well. I guess that I have to buy a bigger beaker in the future. After all of the juice was transferred into the jar, I made some more of the sodium hydroxide solution and proceeded to add it in small portions. When I checked the pH, it was around 11, which meant that I overshoot a little, but it will probably still be ok. Now that I have an orange, swimming pool smelling, forbidden lemon juice, 
I have to filter it to get rid of the small lemon chunks. To do that, I set up a simple gravity filtration using a coffee filter. At first, I put a pan under the filter with the idea that I will later boil off the excess water to be able to use a beaker, but after a few minutes, the juice started smelling weird and making severe bubbles, which looked kinda suspicious. So, I swapped the pan for a beaker and continued on with the filtration. The filtration was really slow, and to speed it up, I tried to use a vacuum filtration setup, but in the end, I stick to the coffee filters. They weren't perfect, because I needed to swap them a few times, as they got clogged up by the juice particles. I really hate filtering stuff in chemistry, because it always takes ages, and can be mildly infuriating. After a whole night of filtering, I now had a jar full of orange lemon juice with some nice foam on top, which was one step closer to looking like pee. The next step in extracting the citric acid was to convert the trisodium citrate into tricalcium dicitrate using some calcium chloride. To do that, I weighed out 40 grams of calcium chloride and dissolved it in some distilled water. It produced a lot of heat, because the dissolvement of calcium chloride is exothermic, meaning that as it dissolves, it warms up the solution. When the solution cooled down, there were some floating impurities in it, and to get rid of them, I filtered the solution through a coffee filter. It wasn't as painful as the last time, and in the end, I was left with a clean calcium chloride solution. Now, I need to add it to the lemon juice. As you can see, the addition instantly precipitates out the tricalcium dicitrate, which is very purely soluble in water. At this point, it is in the form of some nice chunks, which would be very easy to filter off, but instead of filtering them right away, I decided to turn them into a paste and heat the entire mixture to complete the reaction, which turned out to be completely unnecessary, and later I will regret that very much. Anyway, after heating the mixture up, I let it cook for a while, took it off the heat, and now it was time to filter it again. At first, I thought that it won't be too hard, but oh boy was I wrong. This paste is almost impossible to filter by gravity filtration, and by using a vacuum, it filters out very slowly. If this was the only problem, I would not be so angered, but my small and only vacuum pump quickly overheats, and cooling it down is really slow. It even got to the point that I put my pump in the fridge for some time to cool it down faster. I wanted to get this video out in a reasonable time frame, but due to the single mistake, it got delayed by over two days. After some time, I got sick of the vacuum filtration and proceeded to use some coffee filters, but that also wasn't easy because they have terrible speed so I had to use two at once. Also, the filtrate was yellow, smelled pretty bad, and even had that foam on top which made it look and smell almost exactly like pee. Although, it still was a leaked version of the starting lemon juice. After two days of filtering and washing the citrate, I was finally done, and after laying the somewhat dry paste on a piece of aluminum foil, it was time to remove all of the water from it. To do that, I put it into an oven for another night, and in the morning, it was dry and crumbly. The final lead was about 39 grams, which wasn't a lot, but still enough to do what I wanted. Now, for the final step in the citric acid extraction, 
I had to add some sulfuric acid to the tricalcium lysitrate to free up the citric acid and produce calcium sulfate as a byproduct. The sulfuric acid cannot be added at its normal 98% concentration since this would produce too much heat and to counter this I need to dilute it with water. To do that, I weighed out 20 grams of 98% sulfuric acid and then diluted it with 100 ml of distilled water. Then I poured it all onto the tricalcium citrate, and it looks like nothing is happening, but that's only because the tricalcium citrate is an insoluble white powder and the produced calcium sulfate is also an insoluble white powder. After letting it react for a few minutes, I assembled my vacuum distillation setup and filtered it. It filtered surprisingly fast and the filter rate came out nice and clear. In the filter, I also saw a lot of unreacted chunks of tricalcium citrate, which I might process later if I would want more citric acid. Anyway, to get the citric acid out of the solution, I just had to boil it down, and to do that, I placed it on a hot plate with stirring. After a few hours, it was much darker, and some kind of solid was floating in it. When I gave it a closer look, the solid was actually a mix of some really nice small crystals, so I took the whole thing off the heat and allowed it to cool to room temperature. When it cooled down, there were some more crystals, but to get as much as I could, I put the beaker into the refrigerator to cool it down even further. After it was ice cold, I filtered it using my vacuum filtration apparatus, weighted it, and it turns out that I have a whole gram of citric acid, which is close to nothing. I know that I lost a lot of my product along the way, but this yield was so low that I wanted to get more. To do that, I reacted the leftover citrate chunks with some sulfuric acid, hoping to get some more citric acid out. However, after the boiling, I was left with just a black liquid, which didn't have any crystals in it, so I just decided to proceed with my 1 gram of citric acid. The next major step in the process is the oxidative decarboxylation of citric acid using potassium permanganate. I know that it sounds kinda crazy just to say it, but essentially, it means that I need to mix my citric acid with some potassium permanganate and sulfuric acid under strong heating. However, it isn't as easy as just adding the ingredients together, and honestly, I am pretty scared of it. I know that it might fail very easily, but I decided to give it a try anyway. To do that, I first built my modified distillation setup. I know that to some people, it looks like complete garbage, and honestly to me too, but I just don't have the necessary glassware, so as always, I had to improvise. I need to add the permanganate solution dropwise, but I don't have a dropping funnel nor a two neck flask, so I build this abomination with a separatory funnel and some tape. In this scenario, I also don't need a long water cooled condenser, so I replace it with a beaker, some ice water, and a plastic tube. In theory, this setup can work, but will it in practice? Well, I guess it's time to find out. To start the decarboxylation, I loaded the boiling flask with a solution of my whole supply of citric acid and a few drops of sulfuric acid. I also made a solution of potassium permanganate by dissolving 4.8 grams of it in about 80 ml of distilled water. The key here is to use the least amount of water possible because it is harder to boil up the acetone if there is a lot of water present. I poured the permanganate solution into the improvised dripping funnel while making sure twice that the valve is closed. After that was done, I turned on the steering and heating. The mixture in the boiling flask must be near boiling temperature for this to work because if the temperature is too low, the reaction can form formaldehyde, which you really don't want to breathe. 
When the mixture was at the right temperature, I lightly opened the valve and let the potassium permanganate solution slowly drip into the citric sulfuric acid one. At first, the permanganate solution was quickly decolorized due to the low pH, but after some time, it became a brown solution. The reaction that's going on here is just a decarboxylation reaction, which cuts carbon atoms of the citric acid, forming carbon dioxide, which escapes as a gas, and progressively shortens the carbon chain. Finally, only three carbon and one oxygen atoms remain, forming acetone, which boils off and condenses in the collection flask. This reaction is not very efficient, because it forms tons of byproducts and generally is very messy, because when it runs, it covers all of the apparatus in a brown layer of manganese dioxide. Anyway, after adding a lot of the permanganate solution, I saw a few drops of liquid coming over, which smell like acetone that I made in the chloroform from X video. It was a good sign of progress, but after these few dirty drops came over, the distillation stopped. I knew that I couldn't get much acetone from this reaction, especially with 1 gram of citric acid, so a few drops of distillate were kind of expected. The acetone wasn't even close to pure, because it completely resisted being ignited and smelled horrible. <coughs> Aside from all of the imperfections, I was still very happy because I just actually turned lemons into acetone. I could of course just stop here, but as you know, I always like some good chloroform, and I've made it so many times that it would be a sin to not make it now, especially since I have some special acetone. To make the chloroform, I first needed to get my gigantic container of bleach and pour a small amount of it into a test tube. Then I got outside to avoid bringing in any potential phosgene and add the acetone. At first, it sat on the top as a separate layer, but after I mixed with the bleach, it started reacting. The tube got really hot and some of the water started to boil for a second, but everything eventually came down and on the bottom of the tube a small bit of liquid started to form. This was the chloroform and after the reaction was complete, there was maybe like a half a milliliter of it. I didn't plan to use it for anything, but rather to make the proof of concept, because how freaking cool is that you can create chloroform from lemons using the power of chemistry. Anyway, one more thing that I wanted to show you is a cool experiment involving some acetone. To prepare the experiment, you need to get a container that you have to fill with some acetone, uh, you don't have to use very much, a small amount will do. Then get a piece of copper and build something like this from it. It has to hang above the acetone without touching it, but it can't be far away, because then the experiment won't work. When you are ready, you need to use a blowtorch and heat the copper until it is red hot. Then quickly lower it into the container, and if you did everything correctly, the copper should start to glow. The glow is not very bright, but if you turn off the lights, it is pretty clearly visible. What is happening here is that the hot copper acts as a catalyst, which makes the acetone vapors ignite in the presence of air. This only occurs on the copper's surface and generates a ton of heat, which keeps the copper glowing, which in turn burns more acetone. The reaction goes in a loop, which allows the copper to glow for quite some time. One warning when performing this experiment is that if there is not enough oxygen, the hot copper will generate something called ketene, 
which is dependency poisonous, so this experiment has to be performed in a well ventilated area. Anyway, if you made it that far, thanks very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, you can like it and subscribe to my channel. See you in the next one.